Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dante Fortson here with another study for you. Did Christ die for all mankind? Part one, understanding the gospel of salvation. So some of you have been asking me to explain salvation, how it works, who it's for. And we're going to get into all that in part one. So subscribe to my channel. Make sure you click the thumbs up button and make sure you hit the notification bell so that way you can be notified whenever I post new videos. And also, last but not least, make sure you share. Share the videos so that way the word gets out and people can really get an understanding of what's going on in scripture because there's a ton of misinformation out there and my only motive and agenda is the truth. I don't care what that truth is and if I find something that is contrary to what I believe, I change my belief to fit the evidence and the scripture. I don't try to manipulate the scripture to fit my preconceived notions. There's no point in doing that because at that point, you're not believing the scripture anyway. You're believing whatever doctrine it is you want to believe and not not the word. So always make sure you change your belief and perspective to fit the evidence and don't try to manipulate the evidence to fit your belief or perspective. So this study is brought to you by Religion and Relationship. That was my first book I wrote. Uh, for those of you who have not read it, which is probably a whole lot of people because the book didn't really sell a lot, but is my first book that I did is a lot of um, there's a lot of personal stuff in there uh, that I was dealing with at the time. I wrote part of it while I was in jail. And then the other part I wrote actually typed it out and everything when I got out of jail. And so there's a lot of stuff I was dealing with my relationship with God at the time. And so this is one of those books that's more more personal then study uh, kind of more of a I guess you'd call it I guess a slight memoir slight autobiography a little bit with a few uh, lessons in there from the Bible and also the black Hebrew awakening the final 400 years of slaves in America if you want to get a real real good understanding on who we are according to the Bible what the promises are and how we came to be in America this is the book you want to get uh, both of those are available on Amazon.com and Barnes and Noble. So if you don't have those books, check those out. Ultimate Bible Companions. If you have not got your Ultimate Bible Companion yet, it is a lined and or dotted notebook um, for taking Bible study notes. Um, for those of you who like the bullet method, I have the dotted ones out. And for those of you who prefer the traditional lined, uh, those are available as well. They have charts and weights and times and measures and all that good stuff and maps, uh, additional maps that you might not have in your study Bible. So what I tried to do is make this uh, Bible study book or companion uh, really, I guess, more like a sidekick to the Bible. Um, I didn't want to include the same maps that you would probably get in your Bible. I didn't want to include a Bible dictionary because you probably already own one or have that in the back of your Bible somewhere. So I tried to make this complimentary um, to Bible study. So yeah, grab you one of these if you don't already have one. And also before I forget, the, um, the Caribbean flag covers will be out very soon. So if you are from the islands, you'll be able to grab your uh, Caribbean flag covers. I'm going to be doing some other um, flags as well and some other symbols and just different stuff. So check these out. All the covers are meant to reflect our culture. And yeah, that's what it is. It's, it's meant to reflect our culture. I'm not worried about everybody else's culture. I may put out some stuff for everybody else, but right now these are meant to reflect our culture. This is for us. So let's talk about the two schools of thought on salvation. So the first one, salvation is for everyone without exception. You will find this in most black churches. You will find this in most Eurocentric Christian churches. Now, there are some uh, factions who believe that Christ came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel only. Or Christ only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And depending on which side of the fence you fall on whether you're white if you're a white supremacist a white supremacist it is likely you believe that you are israel because of british israelism um, if you don't know what that is you can google it um it's like it's likely you believe that you're the is, true israelites and that salvation is only for white people and then on the other side of the fence we have a lot of the israelite camps that teach that salvation is only for 
Israelites, a.k.a. Negroes. So you have these two doctrines and only one of these can be right. Because if salvation is for everybody, it means that it's not just for Israel. And if it's just for Israel, it means it's not for everybody. So let's look at who is right about salvation. So we'll call it selective salvation. The idea that uh, salvation is only for the, house, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now that comes from Matthew 10, 6. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10, 6. We have another one in Matthew 15, 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So this seems to support the idea of selective salvation. And we're going to come back to these two verses shortly. And then there's the idea of salvation for all. Now, I do want to point out something. The reason I used a black Christ here in this picture is because people often believe that if if someone believes Christ is black, that it's automatically exclusive. And when people think of salvation for all, most times they assume that it's a white Jesus. And I've personally experienced this through uh, really white people I know. When I tell them I believe Christ is black, they immediately ask, well, can I be saved? I don't understand why his skin color changing suddenly in their mind means they can no longer be saved. So you have this um, subconscious racism. I be it comes down to racism, really subconscious racism that if Christ is white, everybody can be saved. But if he's black, only black people can be saved. So their defense of this salvation for all comes from John three sixteen through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the, but that the world through him might be saved. And one of the things I like to do is keep perspective. Now, remember, this was written after the events. So where John starts out saying a verse like this or a couple of ver having a couple of verses like this in the beginning of the book. And you'll see other verses, too. He's speaking in hindsight and then telling the story. So keep that in perspective. So are we under selective salvation or salvation for all? So let's start in the Old Testament. Let's talk about Old Testament salvation. It required laws, statutes, commandments. The sacrifice, the sin offering, the scapegoat, the wave offering, etc. There were a bunch of offerings that were involved in salvation so in exodus 12 49 we see this interesting verse one law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you so the stranger and the homeborn were supposed to have one law then we see in numbers 15 29 this is repeated ye shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. Now, I find this interesting because it says one law for you, one law for the stranger. And then in numbers, it further, it gets more specific. One born among the children of Israel and for the stranger, which in my opinion tells me that there's one law for the Israelites and if somebody is not an Israelite and they're living among the Israelites, that same law will cover them. So let's look at it. Exodus 12, 49. We're going to look at that first. If we look at word 249 right here, we find it right here. Him that is native born. So the one that's born among you refers to being a native. So we know that they're talking about Israelites. I just want to make that clear, which is why I added it. They're talking about Israelites. So there's one law for the Israelite. And then we come over here to 1616, the word stranger. It's gear. I pronounce gear. A sojourner. Alien. Aliens. Foreigners. Immigrants. Sojourners. Strangers. Strangers. So this is referring to somebody who is not an Israelite. And the word sojourn means to stay temporary, a temporary stay. 
to stay for a time and a place or to live temporarily. These are not home-born Israelites. Alien. Because it said also uh, one of the one of the possible interpretations, alien. Often disparaging and offensive. A resident of one country who was born in or owes allegiance to another country and has not acquired citizenship by naturalization in the country of residence. So that would mean they are not a resident of where they're staying. They're a sojourner or alien, a foreigner, a person who has been estranged or excluded. So all right, let's go down the adjectives real quick. Residing under a government or in a country other than the one than that of one's birth without having or obtaining the status of citizenship there. So they are not Israelites. So there's one law to cover the Israelite and one law to cover the non-Israelite. So let's look for context in the Old Testament to see if that's even supported because you'll get a lot of people teaching. A lot of these camps teach that strangers refers to Israelites and that's why I wanted to point that out because they base their doctrine around their preconceived notions that we are under selective salvation. And so instead of trying to rightly divide the scripture, they try to force the scripture to fit their beliefs. And so in order to avoid having to deal with some of the stuff they just alter who it refers to they will say strangers refers to israelites that are visiting from somewhere else and we'll get into that and the gentiles they'll say well the gentiles are really the northern kingdom and we're going to get into that too so let's look for context clues in the old testament to see if the strangers are israelites visiting from somewhere else or if it's referring to non-israelites being under the law are there any examples of the use of the word strangers in the Old Testament? If so, how is it used consistently? And which viewpoint does the context support? So we're going to answer all three of these questions. So this verse right here, Genesis 15, 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Now most of us are familiar with this verse as the 400 year prophecy to Abraham. Now, it says that his seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. So that means that it's using stranger in a sense that they are Israelites and the places they are going, these people are not Israelites. So we see the word strangers used not to refer to people of the same um, descent that are visiting from somewhere else, but it's used to refer to people who are not their own. Exodus 2.22 and she bare him a son, and she called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. Or well, he called his, I'm sorry, he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. So, this is during the Israelite slavery in Egypt. Why would an Israelite say, I've been a stranger in a strange land? Because he is an Israelite and not an Egyptian. So here again, we see the word stranger used to refer to somebody in an Israelite versus non-Israelite relationship. Judges 19, 12. And his master said unto him, we will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. So again, we see here the strangers are not of the children of Israel. They didn't want to turn in there. It's important that we get the context so when somebody comes around saying, hey, the strangers are really referring to Israelites in order for them to avoid saying that, yes, the law was for both the Israelite and the non-Israelite if the non-Israelite wanted to come live under the law. I don't want to get ahead of myself, so we'll keep going. Ruth 2.10. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Ruth was not an Israelite calling herself a Moabite. Do not believe that lie. Ruth was a Moabite. The Moabites were descendants of Lot. And one of the contradictory messages that some of the camps teach is that the Israelites started calling themselves by the name of the people round about. They do that to, again, avoid having to deal with the fact that non-Israelites are allowed to be saved under the law in the Old Testament. Now, Ruth was a Moabite. And one of the things they will say is that, well, they weren't allowed to mix with these other nations. 
they weren't allowed to mix with these other nations and yet they did anyway and i'm going to do a study on that if they were obeying the most high and his laws and commandments in the first place they wouldn't have gotten in trouble so on one hand these camp teachers will tell you that the israelites were not obeying which is why they went into slavery and yet when it comes to them mixing in order to explain, explain their way, they, they say, well, the law doesn't allow them to do that. Well, which one is it? Were they in trouble because they weren't obeying the law or were they obeying the law? And we know that in the book of Judges, there's a whole event where it tells us that they were mixing with these people. So Ruth was a Moabite. She was not an Israelite and she refers to herself as a stranger. Once again, showing the relationship, a stranger is not an Israelite. It, when used in this context and when the Israelites refer to themselves as strangers, it means that they are not of the people that they are referring to. Second Chronicles 6, 32 through 33. Moreover, concerning the stranger, which is not of thy people, Israel, but is come from a far country for thy great name's sake and thy mighty hand and thy stretched out arm. If they come and pray in this house, then hear thou from the heavens, even from thy dwelling place. And do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all people of the earth may know thy name and fear thee, as doth thy people Israel, and may know that this house which I built is called by thy name. This is Solomon after he built the temple. He's talking about strangers or non-Israelites coming to pray in the temple. He says, which is not of thy people Israel. So we know that strangers are not scattered Israelites. So what does the New Testament say? Are there any examples of non-Israelite salvation in the New Testament? If so, what were the circumstances? And what exactly is the gospel? And what happens if we're teaching the gospel wrong? So we're going to get through some of those questions today. And some of those questions are going to be answered in part two. So let's start with John 3. John 3, 14 through 18. <clears throat> And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whatsoever that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So let's break down John 3, 16, uh, because there are a few interesting nuggets in here that you'll want to pick up. Because when people come to you trying to tell you that the gospel is only for Israel, you'll want to acknowledge this. So we're going to go to word 3956, pas. So 3956, let me see if I can get my mouse working here. Oh, there we go. All right, so 3956, um, pos, everyone, right here, 3956, everyone. It is this word right here, whosoever. 3956 is whosoever. Everyone that believes in him. Pos means all, the whole, every kind of. If we go down here to the helps, means all in the sense of each and every part that applies. The emphasis of the total picture then is on one piece at a time, then focuses on the parts making up the whole, viewing the whole in terms of the individual parts. So every person, whoever believes in him, every person that believes in him. Now, see, that's not hard evidence to me. There's still room for doubt. But, but if you need another example, we have Mark 16, 14 through 16. See, the reason we go through all of these verses is to gain more clarity as we continue and not just to throw together doctrine because we see one verse that agrees or disagrees. Afterward, he appeared unto the 11, unto the 11 as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So Mark 16, 15, he told them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we see the word pos again, all, every kind. 
We see the word every. Every kind. Then we see kittis. Right here. Or kits, uh, kitsis. I told you I can't. I butchered foreign words. So this word right here. Creation. It means creation. The act or product. Often of the founding of a city. Creation. Creature. Institution. Always of a divine work. A divine ordinance. So he tells them to preach to all of creation. He didn't designate just Israel. He didn't say we're going to exclude people. He says teach the gospel to all of creation. But I'm going to show you something. This is the gospel right here. 2098. This word right here. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It means the good news of the coming of the Messiah. The gospel. After it expresses sometimes the giver, sometimes the subject, and sometimes the human's transmitter. It says the gospel includes the entire Bible. That's a whole other thing. Um, so we can refer to the um, gospel, the Bible as the gospel sometimes, and the gospel being the good news. When you see these people out here preaching that certain people cannot be saved, does that sound like good news to you? Does it sound like they're preaching the good news? When they're talking to people and saying, hey, you're going to be slaves in the future and you're going to go to hell, you're going to burn. Like they say some of the craziest stuff. That's not the good news. That's not what they're doing. It says to preach the good news to all of creation, not just Israelites and preach bad news to everybody else. That's not biblical. And if it is biblical, tell them to show you in the Bible where it says stand on a street corner and yell at people and tell them that they're going to hell. There's no hope of being saved and they're going to be slaves in the future. That's not biblical. So in case you need another example, of course, I have another example. So we're going to go to first Thessalonians two verses 14 through 16 for ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, but fill up their sins always for the wrath has come upon them to the, ut to, uh, the uttermost. So now right here, Paul is separating himself from the people he's talking to. He's referring to himself with Jews. He's referring to them as other people. And we can see that in the breakdown. So let's talk about Adelphos, brothers. He greets them as brothers. Now, some people will say, well, that's because they were fellow Israelites. However, when we look at the word Adelphos, a brother, a member of the same religious community, especially a fellow Christian, he was greeting them as fellow believers not as flesh and blood brothers. And to further drive home that point, he says that they suffered from their own countrymen, their own tribesmen, a countryman. So it doesn't matter if you're an Israelite that got scattered, you're still of the tribe you got scattered from. Paul is separating himself from them, making a difference between them and the Jews. And then he refers to their own countrymen, which means they are part of a different tribe. They are not Israelites. But in case you need another example, we can keep going. Second Peter three, eight through 10, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So Peter is giving a breakdown of the end of the world right here. And in it, he says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. So let's look at the word any. The word any. We saw it just a second ago. Oh, actually, it's the first time we're seeing it this way. I'm going to show you something in a second. So 5100 right here. Any. A certain one, someone, anyone, 
anyone, someone, a certain one or thing. It has no reference to specifically Israel perishing. He uses the broad word. He, he could have just said the lost sheep of the house of Israel like before. He's not willing that the lost sheep of the house of Israel perish. But instead, there's a whole different word used here. And the reason being is because it's referring to all people. And here's the word we saw before, Pas, 3956. Right here. That all should come to repentance. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And again, we see it's a different word here. He uses two different words that mean everybody. And not once did he use any word that meant just Israel. So let's talk about some contrast and contradiction, because as we can clearly see, the message from the Old Testament seems to be that strangers could come in under the law and could make sacrifices under the law. And I encourage you to read all the chapters that I've given you, read the chapter in the entirety for yourself. Um, the only links that are going to be in the notes today, um, actually, you don't even, I don't think I'm gonna put a link in there because all you need is a, um, Strong's Concordance, which you can get for free, read it for free. Same one I use is at biblehub.com. You, uh, type in the, uh, chap book, chapter and verse, and you click the interlinear button and it'll give you the Strong's Concordance for free. If you don't have one at your disposal and a Bible, we don't even have to go outside the Bible to understand any of this stuff. So let's talk about contrast and contradictions. I'm gonna take a sip of this water real quick. So contrast and contradictions. So while there seems to be evidence that the gospel's for everyone, there's also evidence that the gospel is only for Israel. So in order to be fair, we have to look at that too. So Matthew 10, two through eight, this is what I mentioned earlier and I said we would come back to it. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labius, the, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These 12, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out the devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. So he tells his disciples, Go, teach everybody, but don't go towards the Gentiles, the way of the Gentiles. Don't go towards the cities of the Samaritans. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, I have a question. I actually have lots of questions, but if Christ came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and if the house of Israel are the lost sheep and the Gentiles are scattered Israelites, why did Christ tell his disciples not to go to the lost sheep, AKA to the Gentiles? He just said, do not go the way of the Gentiles. So if you're telling me, that the northern kingdom, the scattered northern kingdom are the Gentiles and they are the lost sheep that he was sent to. Why is he now telling them don't go to these people that I'm sent to? That's just a question. But then he goes right here a couple a sentence later and says, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So you can't have it both ways. You can't tell me the Gentiles are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But don't go to these people, but go preach to these people. That is contradictory. But let's continue. That to me is a flaw in the Israel light only line of thinking. If you interpret Gentiles as Israelites. Now it works if you don't interpret Gentiles as Israelites. That means Gentiles are something else. They're not the scattered northern kingdom. It means they have to be something else. That's the only way that holds up as Israelite only salvation. So for those of you who believe that the Gentiles are the northern kingdom, you have to ask yourself this question and then go ask the leader of your church or congregation or camp or whatever you're part of. If they teach this, ask them to explain that because it does not work. If the Gentiles are scattered Israelites, it simply does not work because Christ says, do not go to these people. I, I was sent for the lost sheep, but don't go to these people who are the lost sheep. That's going to come up when you talk to some camps about Paul. 
when you when Paul is out there teaching the Gentiles that Christ said don't go to, and yet they're trying to say, well, Paul went to teach the scattered sheep. Well, Christ told them don't do that. It, it, it gets to be a whole thing. When your doctrine is not built in truth, it is not consistent. So let's continue. Here's another verse, Matthew 15, uh, 22 through 28. And it's interesting because this verse, these uh, verses right here establish a hierarchy. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast. Canaanites were uh, the Hamites and cried unto him, saying, and, and before I continue, let me point out that some people uh, do point out that it may just mean she's a woman from Cana um, and not necessarily a Canaanite. But again, right here, we'll just use the word Canaanite since it says Canaanite. We'll we won't get sidetracked with it. Saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. So she was clearly familiar with the scriptures. She was clearly familiar with him being the Messiah. And she was not an Israelite. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said, answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So understand something. She was not Israelite, which is why he said what he, she, what he said to her. And she said, but even the dogs get the crumbs. And so it establishes a hierarchy. Christ had put Israel at the top and everybody else at the bottom. And she understood that and she accepted that and she was willing to accept that and said, look, let me just get the crumbs. I, I understand all of that. Let me just get the crumbs. And so he said, OK, here you go. And her daughter was healed. So ask yourself why he would do that. It's establishing a hierarchy, which is going to come around later on in the book of Revelation, where Israel runs the new jerusalem and the gentiles are given that out of court but again we don't want to get sidetracked with that right now let's go back to uh chapter 15 verse 24 but he answered and said i am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of israel okay so we seem to have evidence that israel israelite only salvation is supported in the scripture but israel Israel rejected the Messiah. Israel turned him over to, as, they, as if you missed the last study, addressing the evidence part, uh, I believe, no, no, I'm sorry, part, uh, part three. When I talk about Japheth, they turned him over to the Gentiles to be beat and crucified. And we know that the Romans did it. So, because Israel rejected their Messiah, we're going to have to update the information and look at the other evidence. The wedding supper. Now, one of the problems I have with a lot of the camp doctrine is it seems to be intentionally deceptive. Because I just showed you Matthew chapter 10. I just showed you math, Matthew chapter 15. So ask yourself, why would a teacher who's teaching you the truth take you halfway through a book and develop their doctrine without reading the other half of the book? Should you be listening to somebody like this for your doctrine? So in Matthew 22, this is why I want to use Matthew, because you have Matthew 10, which says he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You have Matthew 15. that says he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You have a bunch of other stuff that happens in between there, including crucifixion and resurrection. But I'm sorry, not resurrection, but uh, you have a lot of stuff that happens in between there. And there's a bunch of parables. Let me back up parables he drops this parable of the wedding supper now this is before crucifixion i just want to correct that before somebody you know says hey this is not where the crucifixion happened so the parables we're going to come back to the crucifixion stuff um in matthew 28 but first i'm gonna show you matthew 22 matthew 22 uh verse 1 through 8 and jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son so you have the father, you have the son. 
And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. What did he send his disciples to do? Go preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And what did they do? They turned them over to the Romans to get crucified. Not yet technically in the story, but you get what I'm saying. Again, he sent forth other servants. Well, those are prophets. But he said he sent forth other servants saying, tell them what you're bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatlings are killed and all the things are ready to come unto the marriage. So he's showing you sending servants. You got the prophets, you got the disciples, you got these preachers and teachers he's been sending. He said, but they made light of it and went their ways. One to his farm and another to his merchandise. They had other stuff to do. And the remnant took to his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up the cities. Then saith to his servants, the wedding is ready. But they which are bidden were not worthy. Who did he call first? The Israelites. They had other stuff to do. They killed his servants. They had other stuff that they would rather be doing than attending this salvation party or this wedding party. But when the king heard thereof, he was, uh, well, let me go back uh, to verse nine right there. Go ye therefore into the highways and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. He said, forget the invitation, forget who was invited. Go get whoever you find. If you find somebody, they may or may not be an Israelite. He said, get as many as ye shall find. He didn't say, bring me only Israelites. But again, if you stop reading halfway through the book, you don't get this far. So you, you who have heard your teachers teaching you, that salvation is Israelite only ask them why they aren't teaching you Matthew 22 and in properly interpreting the wedding supper. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. He didn't, he didn't say, Hey, check their resume, do a background check. They said they found everybody bad and good. And when the king came in to see his guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment and saith unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Who would be the chosen? Israel. Who would be the called? Everybody else. Few are chosen. Those are the invited guests. But the invited guest got rid of their invitation. They rejected their invitation. So many were called. Everybody was called. The good and the bad were called. See, when your doctrine is based in truth, it becomes consistent. So in case you need another example, I have another example. Let's talk about the Great Commission, which is still in the book of Matthew. And the reason I'm going in again on the book of Matthew is to show you that people are intentionally giving you false information when they tell you this is the house of Israel only because the information had to be updated when Israel rejected the Messiah. And this is what I was referring to uh, when I said there's a lot of stuff that happens, the, the, the um, death, the burial, the resurrection, the parables, all that stuff happens before Matthew 28. All you have to do is read the whole book, put everything in the order of events, look at the context. But some of these people who are calling themselves teachers were not called to teach. They're just people who want to teach some stuff they've heard and have not verified it. If you go through the New Testament, one of the signs at the end is people will get rid of sound doctrine in order in, in exchange for doctrine that pleases their itching ears. And a lot of people have itching ears. They hear a message that they want to hear and they get latched onto that message and they refuse to give up that message. And so they try to find a way to defend it over and over and over again. So let's look at Matthew 28, 13 through 20. This is the Great Commission. Most people who grew up in a Eurocentric church or even a black church that had Eurocentric teaching because their pastor went to seminary understand what the Great Commission is. It says, saying, say ye his disciples came by night and stole him away while he, we slept. This is a conspiracy they put out um, when Christ resurrected and they wanted people to think that the disciples stole the body. And if this came to the, if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. So you had 11 people there. And of the 11, some of them were still doubting that, that it was him. 
not just Thomas, some. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So now he didn't say, Go ye therefore and teach the lost sheep of the house of Israel like he did before. He completely changed his message to go ye therefore and teach all nations. And let me show you how much he changed his message. So we're going to break down here. 1484, ethnos, nations. Now we're going to do a whole study on the Gentiles. This is translated as Gentiles in the New Testament. But there are variations of the word ethnos and ethnesin um, and several other variations that actually mean slightly different things when you add letters or remove letters or change letters. So we're going to do a whole breakdown on that. But for now, we're just going to keep a general sense of the word. Go ye therefore and teach all the ethnos. Ethnos, a race, a nation, the nations as distinct from Israel, a race of people, nation, nations, heathen world, Gentiles. So. Now, let me let me go read this right here. Uh, help study. Ethnos, properly people joined by practicing similar customs or common culture, nations, usually referring to unbelieving Gentiles, non-Jews. So, if, if he switched from saying, go teach the house of Israel to go teach the ethnos, it means that salvation isn't just for Israel. So it brings a question. If the Gentiles are the scattered northern kingdom, why does Christ use a word that specifically refers to non-Israelites instead of just referring to them as the scattered sheep of the house of Israel, as he did twice before in the same book? We saw in Matthew 10, he said, lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, he says, lost sheep of the house of Israel. It is until they reject him that he says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go preach the gospel to every creature. And this word ethnos, we're going to come back to it. But the ethnos, again, refers to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are the Europeans. The Europeans are linked to Japheth, who Genesis 10 refers to the refers to as the Gentiles in the first place. Because when your doctrine is based in truth, it becomes consistent. So he says, go ye therefore and teach all the Gentiles, the ethnos, the non-Israelites. And again, we'll break that down when we uh, get further into the uh when we get into the gentile study so in case you need another example and i'm going to read this whole thing because only part of this is going to apply to this but there's another part that i want to point out while we're here um because i'm not going to do a whole study on it this is going to be acts chapter 8 25 through 40 and the reason i'm going to point this out is because two very very substantial things occur right here and then some other small stuff all right, so Acts 8, 25. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Didn't he say, don't go into the cities of the Samaritans? But again, if these teachers aren't called to teach, they aren't breaking down why the sudden shift in Acts, why they are in there teaching to the Samaritans. So, Unless you're going to tell me the Samaritans are also Israelites that are scattered. And the Gentiles are Israelites that are scattered. And all these people are Israel. Everybody's an Israelite that he told the priest to. You have to go back and figure out why there seems to be disobedience. When your doctrine teaches that he's not supposed to teach anybody with Israelites. And he, sp he flat out told them, don't teach the Gentiles, don't teach the Samaritans. And now they're doing both. They're teaching the Gentile Samaritans. Because the information was updated in Matthew 22 and Matthew 28. The same book that y'all get the uh, Israelite only salvation is the same book where he updates the information later on and says, teach everybody. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that thou goest down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the change who had charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. He was an Ethiopian and he came to Jerusalem to worship, which means he is following the Torah or the really the Tanakh. Um, he has the whole book as we're going to see, not just the Torah, but, or he actually, he might only just have one book, 
but he is under he's a man under great authority he's ethiopian or cushite and he's coming down to worship in jerusalem which means he was probably following the faith of judaism which means they were already converted or at least he was and throughout scripture you're going to see other ethiopians that appear in scripture and and help out prophets and are tied to israel so uh, let's see, came to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet or Esaias the prophet in Greek. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to his chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias and said, understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So this Ethiopian who was under the queen and had all this power came to Jerusalem to worship. And he was reading the book of Isaiah and he asked Philip to come explain it to him. And so the rest of this, um, he said, and the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet, the prophet, this of himself or some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him, Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus and passing through, he preached to the cities till he came to Caesarea. All right. So this Cushite Ethiopian who was coming to Jerusalem to worship, who had the book of Isaiah, was familiar with the scriptures because he wouldn't have came to Jerusalem to worship for any other reason. He wouldn't have had the book of Isaiah for any other reason. And as soon as Philip used the book of Isaiah to preach Christ to him, he said, I accept Christ. I believe he's the son of God and have baptized me right here, right now. What's preventing me from getting baptized right here? Because they had been given the commission to preach the gospel unto every creature, to all of creation. And don't get confused how I use the word creature there, but to preach the gospel to all of creation, not just the natural born Israelites, not just the house of Israel. And I know some of you would be saying, well, aren't the Ethiopians Jews? There's an interesting, weird relationship there, because according to the story, when Menelik came to visit Solomon, Solomon sent back thousands of Israelites with him. But remember, the Ethiopians were already a people, so you very likely had a lot of mixing going on in there. So it's very likely that Ethiopians are a mixture of Israelite and non-Israelite or Hamite still living among each other. They're probably all mixed up by now. I don't know. But the fact is. We can only go with what scripture says, and it says he is an Ethiopian, and the, Ethi and the word there, you know, is Cush. He's a Cushite. So we have to go with that for now. So they preached to him, or Philip preached to him. He was baptized. He was not a Israelite from what we know. So now that everything is updated, and now that they have the new marching orders, Hey, Israel, I came for Israel. Israel didn't accept. Now I want you to go preach to all the creation. I want you to go teach all the ethnos, the Gentiles. Let's answer the question. What is the gospel? But before we do that, I want to point out something to those of you who have heard the lie that all Israelites teach a race based version of salvation. I hope you understand that that is not true. Some of us rightly divide the word of scripture and some of us understand that salvation is for all it is for everyone, not just the lost sheep of the house of Israel anymore because Israel rejected that. And so therefore, by rejecting that, we have the example of the wedding supper. We have the great commission and then we have the examples throughout the book of Acts and all the other letters of Paul that they were preaching to people outside of the house of Israel after the resurrection of Christ. And so if you're under Eurocentric Christianity, if you're a black person that's under Eurocentric Christianity of any kind, if you're a black person that's an urban apologist, understand that you have been lied to when they tell you that all Israelites believe the same thing because we don't. Ask yourself, why would these people lie to you? Why would they be trying so hard to keep you away from the truth? 
they know for a fact we don't all teach the same thing. And yet that's what they want to portray in the media. That's what they want to portray in their churches. That's why they put together an urban apologetics community to come in and disrupt our community and teach lies. Because they don't want you to understand that you're Israel. Because it goes back to Pro. Number two on the goals list, prevent the rise of a Messiah. But more specifically, prevent the rise of a black Messiah. They understand that once Israel wakes up and Israel calls back to the Messiah, he returns and sets things right. And they understand that they have invested trillions and trillions of dollars in lying and keeping the secret of who we are, covering it up, repainting all the evidence, forming organizations to counter anything that we say, labeling us as black identity extremists, going as far to declare Judaism as a race or ethnicity so that anything anti-Semitic is now a hate crime. So understand that there is a, a spiritual level of war going on here to prevent the Negro from waking up to who he is. This is why they instituted white Jesus. This is why they will lie and show you white Jesus and tell you that if you believe in black Jesus, you're outside of the will of Christ. If you believe in black Jesus, you're no longer saved. It's not God's will for you to believe in black Jesus, but it's okay for them to paint Jesus white. Even though the Bible says he has skin of bronze, even though every bit of evidence that we have tells you that the Israelites were Negroes and had Negroid features features. It's not acceptable to say that Christ was black. And again, this is all to keep you away from your heritage. This is all to keep you from waking up because we are all involved in a spiritual warfare. But those of you who are still sitting in Eurocentric Christian churches and those of you who are under the urban apologetics movement with non-black leadership, you are in the hands of the enemy. For those of you sitting in black churches and your black pastor was educated with Eurocentric Christian doctrine and that's all they teach and they teach you that you shouldn't want to know if Christ was black or not. While at the same time, they support these people who call themselves Israel in the Middle East, a.k.a. Northeast Africa. The reason that they're doing that is because they, too, are caught up in the middle of this spiritual war fair. They are prisoners of war. So understand what you're dealing with when you deal with these people who say, hey, all these Israelites are the same. They are violent. Not true. They believe in race based salvation. Not true. They teach hate. Not true. All these things are truths to keep you away from the truth or uh, falsehoods to keep you away from the truth. So what is the gospel? We're going to get into the gospel next time in part two. We're going to talk about what it is and why it's important that you preach the right gospel, because there is a curse on anyone that teaches a different gospel than the one presented in the Bible. So it's important you get that right. Otherwise, you are placing yourself under a curse. So don't forget, grab your ultimate Bible companion. If you like to take notes, this is like the perfect notebook for taking Bible notes. If you want to show your support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dante Fortson. Or if you have the cash app, cash app, you can send it to cash tag B H I T B. I also have PayPal and you can always buy a book for those of you who have not yet subscribed. Click the subscribe button, click the thumbs up button, and also make sure you click that notification bell. So that way you get notified whenever I put out new material. So with that said, until next time, enjoy the holidays. I'm out.